Hi everyone and welcome to another edition of City Spotlight. I'm your host Pablo Pereira. As a Calabasas resident, I'm sure you would agree one of the great things about living in our city is just how close we are to nature. Heck, walk out your front door and within a couple of minutes you have all this right in your own backyard. But with that type of nature comes wild animals, and specifically the coyote. And for some residents, the coyote presents a concern for small children and family pets. So today for City Spotlight, we're going to present you with a guide to living with the urban coyotes. This brochure is something very brief. It's a summary of what is in the management plan, and people can just take it home and read it and uh, share information with their neighbors, with their kids, and uh, with their loved ones, so they know how to deal with coyotes if they come near their residence. So I founded Project Coyote in 2008, and we're a national nonprofit charitable organization. Um, we are a coalition of scientists and educators working to foster coexistence between people and coyotes and to also advocate on behalf of coyotes and native carnivores. I've been a resident of Calabasas since 1991 and I learned last summer that the city was uh, trapping coyotes. Calabasas is great. Here we have a no smoking ordinance and we have now we all take our recyclable bags to the supermarkets and you know we banned uh, the use of plastic bags so it's kind of contrary to the beliefs that we all in, you know are instilled in in the city of Calabasas our environmental values we all moved to Calabasas to be surrounded by the beautiful environment around us with the hillsides the Santa Monica mountains and there's no reason to be trapping coyotes So I went to the local uh, city council meeting and I went to public comment and I asked them to please stop trapping coyotes. People generally, when they find out that their tax dollars are being used to kill wildlife, they don't want it, you know? And so when they're able to be empowered to go to their city council or their board of supervisors and say, I don't want my funds being used like that, then that's where the city council, the board of supervisors look for help. That's where we come into play. The next day they did a temporary moratorium on the prohibiting of city funds for trapping and until they had a full study done. That meant environmental reviews, that meant public comment, so it was several months. But then on October 12th, uh, the city passed the um, resolution to no longer allow city expenses and city funds to be used for the trapping of coyotes. As more and more um, cities adopt proactive plans, others want to follow suit because it's a similar circumstance almost everywhere. So what we're finding is actually that as cities like Calabasas adopt a progressive plan, more and more want to follow suit. One of the things that Project Coyote does is we work with municipalities to um, create and adopt uh, pro proactive um, coyote management plans. The Coyote Management Plan is a living document that city prepared based on the models prepared by other cities and other jurisdictions. We reviewed over 20 different management plans and documents, and we came up with a draft that we, we uh, provided to the Environmental Commission and to other stakeholders. We received extensive comments from different uh, nonprofit organizations and individuals, and based on those comments, we finalized the plan and the City Council adopted it in, uh, in November of 2011. This document is available on City's website, and it's about 20 pages. It's a comprehensive, uh, contains comprehensive information about living with coyotes in urban setting. We believe that if we can shift the way we view and treat coyotes, we can shift the way we view and treat other predators. They help to maintain rodent populations, so um, rats, gophers, moles um, on the east coast, woodchucks, rabbits. And they also help to, uh, to keep mesocarnivore populations in check. So these are predators like uh, foxes, um, 
uh, raccoons, skunks, and by doing so, they actually benefit the ecosystem because these mesocarnivores can actually have a, a very deleterious effect on songbird and ground bird populations. So when you have the coyote as the apex or top predator in the ecosystem, you're actually benefiting um, the songbird population. They're scavengers, so they help to keep our ecosystems clean of um, carrion or dead things. So they have those, those three pivotal roles in ecosystems. They're also, I mean, they're native to this area. So um, actually in the La Brea tar pits down in Southern California, they found a coyote-like canid in there. So we know that coyotes have existed in this ecosystem for a very long, long time. So they have a pivotal role in that, that regard. Seth Riley, he is a wildlife biologist with the Santa Monica Mountain Recreation Area, works with the National Park Service. So they actually have been studying the local coyote population, also the bobcat and mountain lion population. They had radio collared, uh, I think it was 110 coyotes in this area. And they were looking at their movement patterns throughout the natural regions and then into the urban landscape. And they found that of those 110 um, radio collared coyotes, none of them became nuisance coyotes. So that's a really important finding you know, that we think that every coyote out there is somehow going to become a nuisance problem, but in fact they're really just coexisting with us. We're not disrupting, it's actually part of a whole ecosystem. So in scientific terms it's called um, guilds of a trophic cascade. So an example is when we introduced wolves into Yellowstone, that actually really benefited um, the whole entire ecosystem because it helped to control some of the populations that were getting out of balance, such as um, elk that were overgrazing Yellowstone National Park. So you bring in a predator and it actually helps the lower levels. It doesn't necessarily, it's not, a, it's not like they're um, going out and, and you know, wiping away these mesocarnivore populations. They're just keeping the whole system in, in check and in balance. A habituated coyote is one that has really lost its fear of people because normally coyotes are skittish, they're wary of people. So habituation usually is caused by intentional or unintentional feeding or by people not um, instilling their natural fear. So that might be a circumstance where you know, a coyote is hanging out in an urban area, coming a little bit closer, just sort of really feeling comfortable around people and people are walking around and making, you know, ma basically making that, comfort that, that coyote feel comfortable. Our message is remove that welcome mat, you know, because that's going to end up in probably not a good situation. The most important thing that you want to do is get that animal to, to uh, retreat and leave the area. So the first thing is, is what we say is just be big, bad, and loud, you know. Put your hands up, yell, scream, um, and then you want to use noisemakers. So pots and pans can be really effective. Um, blow horns, you know, if you're regularly seeing coyotes coming into your area, let you abut open space. Having a blow horn in the back of your yard, you know, that you can just use immediately. Also, um, hoses, so uh, a spray hose that you use to deter the coyote. Um, <clears throat> motion activated lights and also um, the motion activated uh, scarecrow device, which is a water um, motion sensor. California voters uh, banned two types of poisons that were legal to kill coyotes. And they weren't legal for residents to use, they were legal by our federal government. Um, this is sodium cyanide and sodium monofluoroacetate. So we no longer um, allow poisons to be, to be used to kill uh, mammals such as, as predators. But the problem is rodenticides are absolutely terrible for the ecosystem, for Let, wildlife. Let's, let's, you use some big words here and there, and I'm sure okay. most people know what you're talking about, but what you're saying is rat poison. Yes, sorry, rodenticide, okay. um, your, your average Joe Schmo rat poison. Okay. So like um, uh, decon that you can buy over the counter. So these kinds of things that are commonly used in urban landscapes um, can cause a real problem uh, throughout the environment and they persist for a long time. So actually some of the studies that are happening right here near Calabasas in the Santa Monica Mountains are showing just how persistent these poisons are. So what happens is, let's say the rat eats the poison, doesn't die instantaneously, which they often don't, then they go out and then um, a coyote or bobcat consumes that rat 
And what we're finding is a huge percentage of um, coyotes, bobcats, even mountain lions down here are showing exposure to, um, uh, to rat poison. And it can actually kill them. It usually manifests in the liver and they bleed out. So it's a huge, huge problem. And our message to people is, you know, if you have a rodent problem, do not use poisons. You want to remove attractants, and those attractants might be um, uh, certainly securing your garbage, your compost piles, um, not feeding uh, dogs and cats outside, certainly keeping your animals in at night, um, not letting them roam, um, cleaning up bird seed, because the bird seed can both attract the coyotes who eat the bird seed, it can also attract small rodents, which they also consume. So keeping the bird seed you know, in feeders where it's not falling all over the ground. Part of coexisting is just making sure that you secure your cat. So if you were going to put it outside, that you put it into some type of cat enclosure. They have a fence and they have like chain link around it so the cat could go outside if it needs to go outside, but at least it's protected so that a coyote cannot jump a fence and take your cat. Water can be a real uh, attractant to coyotes and really to any animals, particularly in Southern California during drought time. So really recognizing, you know, if you have a pool or koi ponds, irrigation, those can all attract uh, coyotes. Another important one is fruit. Um, coyotes, a uh, large portion of their diet is actually exotic fruits in urban areas. The goal is to remove those attractants. Another one, e dirty grills, you know, um, both the scent and the debris around can attract coyotes. There have been instances where coyotes have um, nipped at or attacked people. And that's important, you know, to recognize those instances. And so what's really important is to look at what caused that. So that's, you know, some of the scientific research is looking at, you know, was there intentional or unintentional feeding going on? Um, was it, you know, a coyote that had mange that might have been more susceptible to aberrant behavior? But what's really important is for people to recognize that the chances of being attacked by a coyote are very, very Coyotes are part of the urban environment and they lived here before we lived, before we moved in. So we have to learn how to live with coyotes. They don't have to learn how to live with us. Even though they, are, they, have, been, uh, they have learned much faster how to live with humans, but now it's our turn to, uh, to, to learn how to live with coyotes in this environment. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of City Spotlight. We hope you've enjoyed the program. More importantly, we hope you've learned something on how to coexist with our four-legged friends. If you'd like more information on the urban coyote, you can always log on to our website at cityofcalabasas.com. I'm Pablo Pereira. Thanks for joining us. <music>